Thank you. Well, first let me thank Andy Morikawa and the Virginia Tech Institute for Policy and Governance for inviting us here today. Uh, we've had a very productive and engaging afternoon speaking with students, faculty, and the community members, and we've really enjoyed it. So thank you for having us. Charlottesville Tomorrow, which launched in 2005, is a community news platform covering growth, development, and local politics. We want to connect our community with vital information they can use to make informed choices about our community's future. It's about building community knowledge, building community engagement, so we can make informed choices. You know, we're trying to help the public understand some very complex issues in our community and the choices about how we grow, where we grow, and when we grow. So why is Charlottesville Tomorrow important? Well, the impetus for Charlottesville Tomorrow came when a visionary group of community members said, you know, we're going to mess up something pretty special if we don't grow differently. These pictures depict some of the special things in Charlottesville and Albemarle County, and I know you could prepare a similar slideshow about this community and make the same point that I'm about to make. These are some of the things that make our community special. These are reasons why people choose to live in Charlottesville, why they go to school in Charlottesville, why they move a business to Charlottesville, why they retire in Charlottesville. If you have these scenic landscapes and a quaint small town, that's going to be a big draw pretty much anywhere in the country, right? Add in a University of Virginia or a Virginia Tech in your case and uh, a mild climate in Virginia, and that's why these are number one communities in a lot of the rankings. But you know, you have to work to keep the quaint in the small town and the scenic in the landscape. Uh, to paraphrase Ed McMahon of the Urban Land Institute, it takes work. And that's what brought Charlottesville Tomorrow's board together in 2005. So we focus on four main things, information sharing with the media, with government, with the public, with decision makers on these growth and development issues. We cover local elections in depth in a nonpartisan fashion. We do research on quality of life issues that our community cares a lot about. That might involve focus groups. It might involve a presentation that we give in the community. It may involve in-depth resources on our website. It may involve a scientific uh, telephone survey, like one we're going to execute in the next month. But it's not just about putting the information out there. It's about engaging the community so that they take action with that information. We have two websites that I'm going to talk about briefly, seavilletomorrow.org and seavilpedia.org. Our website, um, I, I think, represents how we're using technology in innovative ways. It's, you know, it's a cost-effective, uh, off-the-shelf blogging platform. I think it cost me maybe $175 a year to operate the website. Uh, so it's cost effective, but it's very powerful. It's powerful because of how we use it as a platform to engage our community. It's more than a website. It's a new media news center. It's got in-depth local news that you can't find anywhere else. And our audio files, our podcasts, you can download those on your iPod through iTunes, or you can listen to them right on the website. We also have a community wiki called Civilpedia. It's built on the same platform that Wikipedia is built on. They give that software away. The difference is our wiki is hyper-local in focus. It's about our people, places, and events in our community. With Wikipedia, sometimes things don't rise to a notability level that gets them included in that encyclopedia, so we've created our own hyper-local version of that. And it's wide open. Anybody can edit that. I remember uh, two times my board got a little uncomfortable. One was when I told them in 2005 that we were going to have a blog that anyone could comment on. They were a little concerned about comments from the public. And then they got a little concerned when I told them we were going to have a wiki that anyone could edit. Uh, but you know, that's, that's how we've approached uh, engaging our community, is getting them involved in this information sharing. 
Let's talk about community-based journalism. In 2005, we didn't call this journalism. We were bloggers and podcasters. We were filling an information gap. We were informing community choices with hardwired objectivity, ensuring local government accountability. We used these new media tools to build one of the nation's first nonprofit, hyperlocal community news platforms. Now, anyone from Charlottesville has to quote Jefferson in any uh, presentation, and especially a, a student of the university such as myself, so if you'll indulge me. Uh, in 1789, Mr. Jefferson said, wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government, that whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied on to set them to rights. You know, we take that Jeffersonian leap of faith that if we provide our community with the best information possible, they will make smart choices about our community's future. We're doing this in a changing media landscape. This chart shows some research from the Pew Center, and it shows where people are getting their news from. And the, the bar on the left is online news. That's the only one that's growing from 2009 to 2010, the period of this study. Every other source of news, local TV, network, newspapers, audio, magazines, cable TV, declined over that period. But people, the Pew Center study said, are spending more time with news. They're just getting it from different places. You know, the future of news, I think, are these tablet computers and iPads. Uh, I know it's changed how I personally consume a whole lot of news. But Americans are also, according to another Pew Center study, getting their news from multiple sources. 46% of Americans say four to six sources of news. And 75% are getting news from social media. So you skeptics about uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, people are using that to consume local news. Charlottesville Tomorrow is trying to be present in all of those channels. However, you know, I recognized about a year ago that with our small staff, we really didn't have the critical mass of staffing to be successful in all three of our major areas of work, the journalism, the business, and the community engagement. And it was that community engagement piece that I felt really unprepared. Uh, we were sort of reluctant adopters of Facebook and Twitter, but we were lucky if we could just copy our headlines over to those platforms. Fortunately, our local community foundation, the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation, and the Knight Foundation agreed with me that um, we could use some support on that front, and they have funded a full-time community engagement coordinator. Uh, so we've, we've increased our staff to three. And, you know, we've gone down a lot of different roads trying different things. One, one of the benefits of being a small, nimble nonprofit is that you can experiment. You can try things. You can fail, and you can try something else. But our approach was pretty random. With this staff member and the support of this grant, we want to take a really strategic focus to our use of social media. And I think that's a key element of a strategy that's going to make us uh, sustainable and an ongoing uh, civic media platform. These icons represent some of those areas that we've already identified uh, for the Knight Foundation and our Community Foundation. These are things we want them to measure our progress on, so Facebook and Twitter, but also email. Uh, email still does a lot for us. It's one of the number one drivers of people to our website, is our email alerts. We also want to track donations and how those relate to the information we're sharing. But we also want to have face-to-face -face events. It's not just about social media online. We need to interact with our community face-to-face. -face. And we just really didn't have time to organize those things. Uh, now I think we're going to be able to better prepared to do that. Why are we engaging the community? Why is that face-to-face -face interaction important? Well, as I said earlier, it's because we want people to do things with this information. We want them to vote, to speak, to write letters, to participate in public meetings. Uh, that's an important part of the democratic process. We want to equip people to do that. Now, I said a few minutes ago that we didn't think of ourselves as journalists. 
when we started Charlottesville Tomorrow. That all changed two years ago when we signed our partnership with our daily newspaper. It changed, it, it changed our profile in the community, uh, gave us a lot of credibility, uh, gave us a lot of responsibility, uh, but it changed everything from my point of view. In August of 2009, we signed that partnership deal and for the first time in the United States, a nonprofit community organization was doing beat reporting, beat reporting for a daily newspaper. And two years later, I, I believe we're the only nonprofit in the country that has an in-depth relationship of this scope and this depth um, that's working with a for-profit newspaper. What does the newspaper get out of this? They get, I think, some of the best content available, right? Um, they're getting accurate content from experienced observers of our local government. We've been in this community. We've been embedded in Charlottesville for quite some time. What do we get? Charlottesville Tomorrow gets a much larger audience. We get access to professional editors and graphic designers, photographers, and we get a printing partner for our local election voter guides. So in the slide here, you can see a front page of the, of the Daily Progress. And this was, I think, a, a good example because it shows the power of our words being combined with the graphic talents of somebody at the newspaper who can show schematics of what an earthen dam for the community's water supply would look like and how the different components of that infrastructure fit together. I couldn't pull off something like that. So it's a true partnership. Um, in the lower right-hand corner is a link to a video that we did of a 3D model of this same dam. And then you can see there examples of the voter guides that earlier this month were in, in the mailboxes of everybody voting in a competitive local election. So the status of the partnership in 2011 is that we're doing about 24 stories a month for the newspaper, but that represents 50% of the newspaper's coverage of growth, development, and local politics. Let's put some numbers on this partnership. There they are, any questions? Um, we have three full-time staff, as I mentioned, at Charlottesville Tomorrow. We also have a couple interns who do great work for us. Uh, the ability of some of our high school graduates and recent college graduates is just phenomenal to me, and uh, we really celebrate that. We've been in business six years now. Our budget is about $280,000. We've put 415 stories in the newspaper, 416, because uh, Kurt had another one today. Our intern got another story in today. That's a 17% increase in the newspaper's coverage. It's a 219% increase in traffic on our website. They haven't paid us a dime for that content. And I don't think there's anybody else in the country that's doing this. Now, some people would say that's because they're not paying a dime for this. This chart represents you know, what's going on with civic media in our community. These lines represent the three, day, three papers in Charlottesville. The Daily Progress is on top. The two lines at the bottom are our two we weeklies. So you've got the three print papers here. And this goes back over several years, and it's a count of the number of articles published on growth, development, and local politics. So here you can see uh, a disturbing trend for all three of these publications. The ability to cover civic media is on the decline. In June 2011, the Federal Communications Commission released a report on community information needs. Among the findings, it said an abundance of media outlets doesn't translate into an abundance of government accountability reporting. So I think you see that in our Charlottesville example. We have an abundance of print newspapers, but they have less and less ability, or they choose to have less coverage of local government. Why is that? Well, the FCC continues, and they say it's because of shrinking resources in our newsrooms. National spending on newspaper reporting capacity has dropped $1.6 billion between 2006 and 2009, a reduction over four years of more than 25%. So if you have less money in those newsrooms, you have less reporters, 
you have less coverage. Now, I hope you're asking yourselves, well, what has Charlottesville Tomorrow done to that line on the top? What have our stories, 416 stories and counting, what have we done to the trend for the daily progress? That's what we've done. So you can see here, they're on quite a different trajectory now as far as the newspaper's ability, our local paper, to cover this beat. And I bet they're the only newspaper in the country that can make this claim. I want to show you a little bit about how in-depth and a little bit about the mechanics of how our relationship works. I, I use this slide with my board of directors, and I purposely put a uh, sun and a moon on this picture to show them we're working day and night uh, to get the news out to the public here. But, you know, it starts with a planning session between myself and the editors at the newspaper. Each week we decide what meetings are coming up on the calendar, which reporters are going to write which stories every week. We plan that out. Uh, we then go to those meetings. We cover them, we record them, we write the story. We send the copy of the story to the Daily Progress editors. They send back edits, which we incorporate into the final piece. Now, at that point, the newspaper goes on and does what they always do. They've got people that do layout. They've got photographers. In, in the case of Charlottesville, our newspaper is actually now laid out in Lynchburg by Media General. It's printed in Richmond. It's then trucked to Charlottesville and distributed. And, you know, you can ask yourself how long that's going to continue. Um, they're doing everything they can to economize and be more efficient and get efficiency in, in the scale of of their operation, but there's a whole lot of work there. Now, the whole lot of work on our side is that we are basically a one-man band. So we're the reporters who have to both get the story, take the pictures, crop the pictures, resize them, lay them out. We have to take the audio, produce the audio, put the podcast online, and get it all ready uh, to go live on the website. And the, the trust that's involved is substantial between the newspaper and Charlottesville Tomorrow to the point where we now publish directly to their website. So every one of our stories goes live immediately on the Daily Progress website at the push of a button. Um, and so it's a, powerful, it's a powerful collaboration. I want to touch on that second data initiative briefly, and we call this Seville 3 d and that's because we're building some of the things that we're talking about in our news coverage. We're talking about earthen dams. We're talking about gas stations. We're talking about highways. In some cases, we just go build these things in Google Earth using a free pro program called Google SketchUp. It's amazing what an architecture undergrad student can do for you in this program. Why do we do this? Why does a, a news a community organization like ours go to the trouble of building things in Google Earth? It's to tell a better story is to help the public understand more in depth what we're talking about. These are complex issues, and I've sat through five years of, of uh, architecture review board meetings, planning commission meetings, you name it, and I know a lot of the decision makers don't understand the proposals in front of them when they're looking at these two-dimensional drawings, and they're trying to figure out, is the public who's speaking at the microphone right about the noise, about the glare, about the way a building looks, about the impact it's going to have on the view shed, or is the developer right? Everything's going to be beautiful. The trees will all be grown. It'll be a sight to behold. Everyone will want to buy gas at the restaurant station, which you see in the lower right-hand corner. Now, our job is not to say whether that's a good gas station or a bad gas station. We use this as a tool to say, this is what we're talking about. You make up your own mind. And in the top right corner, you can see where we're teaching other people how to use SketchUp in the community. We just hold training sessions. This has been one of the biggest events people come to. And now I'm charging for it to cover, uh, cover our cost. Uh, but people really want to learn new skills. So this is our, our toolkit. Our news center on our website, our wiki, our newspaper partnership. We also have an iPhone app. And we look great on the iPad if you use a program called Flipboard. I know somebody's going to ask about money, so I just want to get these numbers in front of you. This is the uh, percent breakout of where we get our revenues. So as I mentioned, the $280,000 budget split uh, pretty evenly this year between major gifts and foundations. We do an annual campaign that's very important, uh, and that's a great community engagement tool, frankly. 
Um, but in previous years, we were much more heavily skewed towards the major gifts. We need to find that right sustainable mix of revenue streams. Uh, we're going to add next year more underwriting and events to this pie. And I think that'll help with the balance. So I often close with this photo of my children. And looking at it now, I realize that I've been at this a while because uh, my daughter's in college and my son is taller than I am. Um, I think another point in the FCC's June 2011 report is, is worth closing on, and I think it's an optimistic note uh, with which to finish. But the FCC concluded that a community needs a critical mass of full-time journalists. You know, it said innovations that we've talked about tonight, blogs, citizen journalism, social media, those are at the heart of this new media system that we're in the middle of inventing. But without professional journalists, the community is not going to get the information it needs. Put them together, though, and the media, media ecosystem can thrive like never before. Put them together, and I think you've got a powerful tool to advance civic media, democracy, and quality communities. Community-based nonprofit journalism is thriving uh, in Charlottesville, but there's room for growth. Our citizens should have the same expectation for issues like education, social services, the arts, public safety. Those are quality of life issues, too. Finally, my story would not be complete tonight without highlighting uh, the contributions of several key people. Uh, Sean Tubbs is our senior reporter. He's in the audience tonight. And he's a 1995 graduate of Virginia Tech um, and found himself uh, slipping between the UVA lingo and the tech lingo uh, today and forgetting it's not the grounds, it's the campus. Uh, so I, of course, enjoyed that. Um, two of our founding board members, Michael Bills and Rick Middleton, you know, they had the vision to recognize that our community needed a Charlottesville tomorrow. Their passion, my entire board's passion for the belief that we need to protect a special place, ensuring that we grow in a way that doesn't sacrifice our quality of life, and that's what keeps us going. And finally, McGregor McCants, the editor at The Daily Progress. I give him a lot of credit for initiating this partnership, helping it grow into a very effective collaborative undertaking that benefits our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, for helping us to understand new platforms for community journalism. We are looking forward to learning from you and the good people at Charlottesville tomorrow as we explore developing such initiatives here in the New River Valley. I'm Kate Preston, a doctoral student in public administration and policy and a member of the Community Voices organizing team. Brian, we greatly appreciate your leadership and vision and for developing a journalism for engaged citizens and informed choices. Your talk has helped us to frame the next part of our conversation with our audience this evening. Another member of our Community Voices team, John Catherwood Ginn, will engage you with some questions that will help us to look more closely at journalism today and in communities like ours. Thanks again, and I'll hand it over to you, John. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Brian. That was a real pleasure. Thank you. Um, as Kate mentioned, my name's John. I'm a second year student in uh, the Department of Theater and Cinema in the Master of Fine Arts program in Directing Public Dialogue. Um, this next portion of our program tonight is inspired by a program you may be familiar with. Those of you who have seen Inside the Actor's Studio. Um, for those of you familiar, I hear a couple chuckles. Obviously, you'll be our celebrity guest. Yeah, okay, I'll try. And then, <laughs> obviously, I'll be the James Lipton. <laughs> so just imagine a beard, and we'll go from there. <clears throat> so I wanted to start tonight um, uh, by just sort of talking a little bit about uh, where we're going to go from here. So first, I'll be asking Brian some questions about, obviously, Charlottesville tomorrow. Um, about new platforms for community-based journalism to help us deepen our own understanding of how a community similar to ours um, has developed a journalism that is helping shape the changing landscape of community news, building new platforms for engaged citizens and informed choices. After we have a bit of a conversation based on some questions that we've prepared and some things that you've shared in your presentation, we're going to open it up to a, to a community conversation and I invite you to share any questions or comments you have based on what you saw in the presentation or questions here. So without further ado, I'd love to get started. Okay. Uh, one question I had in, in seeing your presentation, just sort of to frame what Charlottesville Tomorrow is doing as well as many other organizations, how would you describe how community-based journalism 
um, is distinguished from other models of journalism? Well, you know, for me, it, it comes when I think about Charlottesville and the the media that we have there. A lot of the reporters in town, they're brand new in our community, right? So they have just graduated from some university. They've moved to Charlottesville because there was an opening at the TV station or the newspaper. They're, they're in their first job. They're handed a laptop or a camera, and they're told, you know, city council's that way. Go get us a story. And we would call up those people and take them out to lunch in 2005. And we'd say, you know what? We're a nonprofit. We're fair, balanced, objective. We're just here trying to help inform the public. We can help you too. So call us anytime. If you need background information, you want to try to figure out something. Um, so getting back to community-based journalism, I think, of, I think it's very powerful to have people embedded in a community who know the community, right? They're going to be able to tell a, a more in-depth story about what's happening and put it in context with that community's history. Um, so for me, that's the, the number one thing that stands out, just having, having a sense of, of one's community. Mm -hmm. And I hear in that a sense of relationship. The people that you're reporting on are those that are doing the reporting really have an understanding of who they are and their relationship to the community they've been living in. Sure. If, you know, I've been an elected official and when a brand new reporter calls you, you know, there's this sort of gut check, uh-oh, you know, what, what's going to happen in this interview? And we do build those relationships up with the, uh, the elected officials that we cover. Um, so th they know our approach. They know we're going to do everything in our power to get the story right. They may not like it, you know, what we're reporting, uh, but they're not going to be able to argue with whether it's accurate. And, and so we build trust one story at a time. Hmm. Would you be willing to share a, a story about a, a moment of either major trust building or you felt like that trust might have been jeopardized based on the reporting that Charlottesville tomorrow was engaged with? Well, I, you know, when, when we signed the partnership with the Daily Progress, one of the things that was interesting was it elevated our profile in the community. And suddenly, everybody wanted us to write their stories for them, right? <laughs> so now we're starting to get phone calls because people saw us as a path to the printed newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't something, you know, we really expected going into this. But it gave us that sense, you know, we, boy, we've we got to be on top of our game here. Uh, we have a responsibility now as, as a serious journalistic venture that's putting stories in a printed paper. And what I think the moment for me was when we could call the editor at the newspaper and say, hey, we've got a source with this piece of information. You know, we've checked it out. We've verified it. And we think, you know, this merits a story. And they backed us up. Um, other times have been when we've been challenged, you know, by sitting elected officials about something we wrote. And we went to the, the Daily Progress and we said, you know what, we've got the audio of that <laughs> meeting or that interview. You know, you can listen for yourself. But, you know, this guy's uh, barking up the wrong tree. And, and the newspaper backed us up. Hmm. So it, it was, it, again, building trust with the paper. And, and they had a lot of uh, respect for us because they watched us for four years before they approached us uh, for the partnership. So they sort of knew, you know, the, the level of work uh, they were getting into. Mm -hmm. And so what was that transition like? Because I can imagine after four years of working on it, building this sort of unique partnership, as you put it, potentially unique to the, in, to the whole country, I can imagine that had some, some, uh, some sort of curious retoolings. Would you it be able to speak to what that transition was well, like? Well, we had to learn, I, I, for me personally, and, and I think Sean has shared this as well, we had to learn um, a, a different craft of producing a news story. Um, we never really worried about having a, you know, a lead paragraph that really grabbed the reader <laughs> and, you know, moved them through our, our story. We were just blogging and podcasting, so we would go to government meetings, capture whatever was said, write up a summary, put it online. And um, we cared less about really the craft of journalism and more about the information sharing. So we had to learn, and the editors at the Daily Progress were very good about uh, uh, schooling us on this uh, topic, and I'm self-trained doing this, so I had a lot to learn. Um, but you know, you know they, we, we are big consumers of news, so we sort of knew you know, what we needed to steer towards, mm -hmm. but it involved things like you know, chasing people down after a vote. 
we never used to worry about that. You know, people would leave and we'd sort of laugh, and chuckle at all the reporters, you know, running out of the room to, to go interview people. But then we suddenly realized, oh, we have to do that. Uh, we have to get that quote. You know, how do you feel about the vote that just happened? Because that's going to be in the paper the next day. We didn't have to worry about that before. Uh, we could call them up the next day on our own schedule because we didn't have that sense of a deadline looming. So we had to adjust pretty quickly in our, our, uh, in our schedules as well mm -hmm. uh, because suddenly we had to time our production with the newspaper's reporting deadlines. Uh, so I, uh, Sean Tubbs is still working for me, which is great, uh, <laughs> but he, he's had to put up with, uh, both of us have had to put up with a lot of late nights uh, because that's what it takes uh, mm -hmm. to produce news. But we feel so passionate about it. Um, uh, we think it's important. That's great. Well, considering that transition um, to the, this model that, as you said, daily progress is schooling in these kinds of techniques, how do you feel like that's impact not only the content you've written, but potentially your relationship with readership? People who have been reading it, you know, in this case, since, um, since its beginning. Well, I, li I like to think our readers, our subscribers are getting better stories because um, now hopefully they do have a good lead paragraph. We're being thoughtful about what we write and how we say things and which voices we're, we're, we are bringing into a story. We're much more thoughtful about that. We used to do only meeting-based stories for the most part. We'd cover a meeting, we'd tell people what happened. My board of directors and, and us personally as, as journalists, we want to do other kinds of stories too. Enterprise stories, feature stories. We want to be able to get out in front of an issue and get that in front of the community before the public hearing to make sure people understand what's at stake. Um, so those are you know, other, other things we've learned along the way. Again, my hope is, and, and I only have anecdotal evidence from our supporters, but people say they really enjoy the content that we're producing and, and they look for our logo in the newspaper uh, to know that you know, that's a story that we produced. Well, speaking of your relationship to your readership, I was really fascinated in your presentation and in, in exploring your website, um, some of these sort of open source technologies you're employing, like Seville 3D, for people get, having an opportunity to see the way these models uh, will develop in the community, um, as well as uh, Seavillepedia. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the, what do you feel like the role is in open source methodologies mm -hmm. in community-based journalism, both yep. the benefits and potentially the challenges embedded in that decision? Yep. Um, I'm, for me personally, it's less about being open source and more about being free. Um, so <laughs> we, we were looking for free off-the-shelf tools. I don't have uh, a web designer on staff. I don't have a network team. Mm -hmm. you know, I used to manage those people when I worked at SNL Financial, and I know how much money they can get uh, out, <laughs> out of a company. And so we came into this from the beginning saying, we're going to do this on the cheap as much as possible, use off-the-shelf products that are cost-effective, and um, push the envelope with what can be done with those tools. So Sevilpedia was a, a, a recommendation from Sean Tubbs. He said, you know, Brian, we could use that as a database to keep track of all this information we're coming across. So we, we downloaded the software, we set it up, we didn't share it with the community for probably a year and a half. We just kept filling it with information we would come across and trying to learn how to use a wiki. At one point I realized, you know, we've got enough here that we should just share it with the public. We turned it on. And, and as I said in my talk, you know, my board of directors was a little uh, terrified at the prospect of our information being able to be edited by anyone. Mm. But that's what a community wiki is. And we put it out there. Sean and I remember, you know, we're at home or in the office, I can't remember where, or you can watch the edit logs for the wiki. Mm -hmm. And the next day, <laughs> somebody had logged in and started changing all sorts of things. And what they were changing, though, was the organization, the structure. They were using all this wiki markup language, text, terminology that we knew nothing about. And we were sitting back just, you know, this is brilliant. You know, how great is this? That this person has just found us and is making it better, one article at a time. So we learned a lot. We now know who that person is. Um, but initially, they were anonymous. And they logged into the wiki and just started making it great. Uh, Seville 3D 
was um, again sort of a inspiration from what you see on you know CNN when you see them zoom in on a community and the buildings pop up out of the ground. And as I mentioned, I've sat through lots of meetings where the officials are looking at these two-dimensional drawings and trying to convert it in their head. And some people can do that, some can't, to figure out what it will really look like when it's built. And then I saw there was, uh, I met an architect in Charlottesville, Bob Pinio, and he said, you know, Brian, there's this free tool, SketchUp. I'm really good at it. I designed my whole house with this thing. And, um, you know, maybe you'd have a use for this. And I said, yes, we do. You know, let, I have this project, it's an earthen dam, and I've been trying to explain this thing for five years to the public. <laughs> and um, we need a better way to explain it. Can, can we fly around it if you build it in Google Earth? And he did. And it wasn't just the dam, but it was where the pipelines were located. And for the first time on one map, we had the entire water system for Charlottesville Albemarle laid out in a way you could really fly around it and understand how these key components fit together. Um, so I think those two data initiatives, the Wiki and Seville 3D, again, that's a way, it, it sort of separates us from a traditional media outlet. We're, we're trying to take it to the next level, but engage the community with this information because both of those tools are ones where the community can just come along and make it better. They can add their own knowledge, their own, uh, perspective. If somebody builds a better model of the dam, they can upload it and put it in there. Let's see what that looks like. Hmm. So long as we're, I was going to offer one last question before we turn it over to have a conversation with our audience here tonight, but on the topic of uh, these two programs in particular, I'm really um, inspired by the accessibility and the openness of these kinds of platforms. Would you be willing to share any other sort of um, uh, innovative uh, technologies that you're thinking about employing in the future through Sartsville tomorrow, tomorrow that are like that? There's not a, I can't think of a next big thing on that front. Mm -hmm. The next big thing for me is to get people really using those two tools. And we've been good at, you know, sort of getting a nascent start to these data initiatives. Part of our grant with the Knight Foundation and our community foundation is to have our community engagement coordinator teach people about these tools, help publicize that they exist. I mean, we really haven't had until now with this grant a budget to really advertise that these tools exist. If you look at our news stories, you may see hyperlinks. They typically go to articles with in-depth content in Civilpedia, but unless you know you're finding our story and clicking on them, you may not know it's there. One of the things we're gonna do is, is talk up these initiatives, train people how to use them, and try to, you know, there, there's a little bit of a learning curve to both tools, mm -hmm. and we wanna make that easy and as accessible as possible. I think there's a lot to be done with students in our community, high school students in particular. Mm. These, these young people, uh, the, there's not much of a learning curve for them. They grab onto these things, they get it. I mean, my son spends a whole lot of time, probably too much time, in a 3D world. It's called uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, I think. <laughs> and I would love it if he was playing around in a 3D Charlottesville instead. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, th they think about 3D models like that, and they think about computers like that. And um, we're, we're gonna, we work cooperatively with one of the high schools in an in-depth uh, relationship where we get to, to uh, speak with the entire senior class of one of our high schools. Uh, so it's half the class one semester, half the class the next. But we talk to them about public policy issues. I hope to uh, be able to expand that and maybe talk with uh, you know the, the computer-aided design uh, team that is teaching people how to do drafting or uh, that, that kind of work to get them thinking about using SketchUp. One of the things I, I said to the UVA students in the architecture program was, you know, you're building these models in Google Earth as examples. You know, you're doing homework for your teacher. You're building our community, but you're not sharing it with anybody. You know, it's in this silo at the university, and nobody in the community gets to see it. So I met with the students and the faculty. Now the dean of the architecture school is on our board of directors. And I said to them, you know what, when you do your homework, all I ask is that you publish it hmm. in this free online repository. You know, share it with the community. If you're going to build part of Charlottesville, share it so we can see how it fits in. And have, if we can get the fabric of our community online, uh, that'll help us make better decisions 
When we started the project, there were two buildings in Charlottesville and Google Earth. And you can probably guess which two. Uh, <laughs> the Rotunda at the University of Virginia and Monticello. Those are the only two buildings in Google Earth. I, I don't think uh, Blacksburg was much better. I did, I did check. I went to Virginia Tech. I was hoping Virginia Tech was going to be completely built out so I could then uh, shame uh, the University of Virginia <laughs> into uh, uh, catching up with Tech. But, uh, but I think we both have some work to do. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Brian. At thank this, you. At this point, we're going to transition to invite audience members. If you'd like to share a question or a comment on something Brian shared this evening, I'd ask that... Um, for ease of everybody being able to hear, as well as for the recording equipment we have, if you do have something you'd like to share, just please raise your hand, at which point um, I'll motion to one of our, um, our team members here with microphones to come over to, to help catch your voice in the microphone. So would anybody like to kick things off with a question? Yes? Right here? Oh. Right down here, Kate? Oh. 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 Down here. Oh. Um, why do you think it's called Charlotte? Charlottesville tomorrow instead of Charlottesville today? That's a good question. People often mix that up. Uh, the other question I get asked is, why is it not Charlottesville Albemarle tomorrow? People in Albemarle get offended when you don't mention them. <laughs> and we thought that was too big of a mouthful. So, and when I'm, you know, traveling around, if I was visiting your town, I would say, you know, I'm from Charlottesville. Now, technically, my home is in Ivy, Virginia, but most people don't know where that is. So I say, you know, the closest city that people will know. So we're used to saying, you know, we're from Charlottesville, but in our reporting, we try to talk about the broader community um, in Crozet, in Scottsville, in Ivy, in all the little towns around Charlottesville. Why tomorrow? Because we want to be uh, forward thinking. We want to think about tomorrow. We want to be in, intentional about how we grow as a community. Um, so we're trying to get people thinking, you know, the decisions we make today, as you said, affect our tomorrow. Good question. Yes, we're here. Could you talk a little bit about the role of your board of directors in your own strategic planning and in supervising the work you do? How have you found their role uh, over these years, and has it changed any? Yep. In the beginning, we spent a lot of time uh, recruiting the first board of Charlottesville tomorrow. Um, I mentioned our two founders, Michael Bills and Rick Middleton. And uh, we wanted to recruit a board that would um, s get the community's attention. We wanted people to look at the board and say, well, that's interesting that those two people are on the same board. Why is that? This, this must be something different. Because uh, usually those two people don't play well together, right? Um, we wanted to have different politics represented on our board. Um, ideally, we'd have a, a board that was more diverse racially, uh, more diverse geographically, but it's a, a work in progress. As a nonprofit, you know, my board of directors, that's who I report to. So they, they hire me as the executive director. But because of their leadership role in the community, I mean, they are our number one ambassadors out there. They're talking to their friends uh, about this work, about why it's important, explaining what we do and why we do it. And early on, that was really important because we were trying to sort of demystify what Charles Till Tomorrow was all about. There were a lot of questions, what we were up to. We, we must have some hidden agenda. Um, it was also important for fundraising. So our board, um, you know, they have to make those tough calls to their friends and they have to write notes on their fundraising letters and they have to help me fundraise. So we need people that uh, have those kinds of connections in the community. Our board is interesting in that they know, even though they have strong beliefs politically and about certain issues, they sort of have to check that at the door. When they're at a Charlottesville Tomorrow board meeting, it's not about saying, this is the right answer, and you know, Brian, you and Sean need to write this story um, because, and tell people what the right answer is, because that's not what we're about, and we haven't been. We've never had an editorial voice in our work, and that's very important. So they sort of check that at the door. And when they meet as a board, it's about, you know, what are the issues that need more attention in the community? Not what's the right answer, but what, what is the public not fully informed about or fully engaged in? And so what the board's role is to, you know, do the basic things like approve the budget and, and 
evaluate me as director, but also help set the stage in a strategic plan about what issues uh, we're going to focus on. Got a small staff. Another key decision we made, the board made, was to stay focused on growth, development, local politics, at least initially. So we've done that the first six years. Uh, this sort of builds on that question, I guess. Uh, the issues you talk about, growth development, uh, focus on growth, development, local politics, are potentially very divisive issues. What kind of challenges have you faced with those types of polarizing issues when you're talking about community engagement? And then, I guess, a, follow, a second part of that question is you mentioned trying to be uh, unbiased and objective, and yet part of the power of the media seems to be the power to uh, the influence they have in framing the story. For example, saying this is a story about sprawl versus this is a story about economic growth. How right. have you dealt with that kind of challenge? Good questions. Um, so on the first issue, yeah, we're, we're covering very controversial issues. I mean, to the point where Sean and I often get uncomfortable in meetings uh, when we watch the public come forward and be very vocal. You know, part of us is celebrating because, hey, we've, we've, the public's obviously engaged uh, on this topic. But it is hard sometimes to see um, the city and county butting heads or um, two factions in the public fighting over something. We see our role as helping all of those players. Um, so we get a sense of satisfaction at the end of the day if we can give them the best information possible and if we have both sides on a given issue saying, you know what, that was a good story, uh, then we've, we've done our job. And that, that's what we strive for. Um, hopefully, by getting that information out on the table, and I mentioned um, earlier today in our talks that oftentimes our stories are sort of the communiques between the city and the county and the university. They don't go to each other's meetings most of the time. And we have found that our stories are sort of the communique between the bodies, and they often reference you know, our coverage in their meetings. And they say, oh, I see the people in Albemarle are saying this, and oh, those city councilors are saying that. Um, that's part of that sense of responsibility. If we get the story right, you know, we're at least getting the facts out on the table about what those different parties are thinking. And, and, uh, and hopefully that makes for a more productive conversation. And um, to remind me of the second part of your question. OK. Yeah, but you know, on, on that front, is, is there a bias? Sure. Um, there's a bias in that we're picking which issues to focus on. I would say most of the elections in Albemarle County over the past six years have been framed heavily on growth and development. And that's because we're putting out a whole lot of information on growth and development. Now, if Charlottesville Tomorrow expanded and we covered other issues like education, you might see future elections where those issues rise in importance. Um, so again, that, that is a powerful factor that we're bringing to the table, which issues we focus on. Um, but we always do it in a way that we think is, um, you know, our, we strive for objectivity, neutral in tone, you know, fact-based, objective journalism. There's one in the back. Yeah, in the back there. Thank you for bringing this to us. It's really inspiring. Um, I have a question about uh, your income. Um, uh, what, if anything, are you thinking about or planning to do with regard to uh, finding earned income as a possible uh, section of the pie? My board often asks that question. Um, you know, fee-for-service activities, uh, which is what I think you're, you're suggesting we do as a nonprofit, um, you know, we could probably charge a lot more for those trainings for how to do Google SketchUp. Um, we could have developers approach us and say, hey, I've got this building project. Actually, they have approached us. Um, uh, you know, and they've said, can you build this for me in Google Earth so I can show it to the public? And we've, and we've chosen to say no to those offers. And the reason is we're going to end up writing about that story. And I don't want to be taking money from a developer that I'm covering 
uh, in a newspaper. I don't want to set up a potential conflict of interest. So one of the challenges with these fee-based things is avoiding conflicts of interest. Um, government could easily approach us and say, hey, you're already streaming our meetings, at least the ones about growth and development. Would you consider live streaming all of our meetings? And we'll pay you to do it. And we would say no. We're not going to. We're not going to take money from local government because we cover you. You know, we don't want to be the subject of a budget discussion. Um, so that that's a hard. It's been a hard thing for, not for us to crack. And I think what we're doing instead is focusing on uh, seeking underwriting, like the non like NPR, uh, like local public radio, where we can get uh, commercial entities in town to say. I believe in community news, and you know we underwrite Charlottesville tomorrow, and that can sort of separate to some degree um, our coverage of a specific issue. But we're in uncharted territory here. You know, in a big newspaper, these roles are firewalled and separate. The journalists do their thing covering meetings. The sales team is out getting underwriting ads. The managing editor and the publisher are dealing with the board of directors of media general in this case, right? I've got to do all those things as a small nonprofit journalism venture. Um, so we think very carefully about the ethics and, and how we're conducting ourselves. Um, you know, I had a, a candidate running for local office send me a check uh, for $100. Charles tomorrow, I support you guys. Here you go, here's 100 bucks. I was like, you know what? I can't take your money. Uh, we're covering you in this election. Um, so I sent it back to her. You made the assertion that you're the only uh, similar model of your work with a uh, newspaper. But uh, I, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but there certainly are other nonprofit journalism enterprises. Great question. Yep. In the country. Yep. Okay. And if that's true then um, why do you think others have, what are the barriers, what are the challenges for others to have engaged with a traditional uh, yep. media? I, I was hoping somebody would call me on that. Um, <laughs> it's, when I make that assertion, it's because um, for the past two years I've met with uh, people like Jay Rosen, who uh, is a journalism professor who covers these issues. When we signed the partnership, we sort of carefully scanned uh, with some journalism experts in the, in, around the country uh, to make sure this was something new. You know, you think of something like ProPublica, um, and what's different about that is it's deep dive investigative journalism. These are stories where they're going out, they're getting the data, and then they're then, you know, offering up that story to a New York Times, LA Times, et cetera. What we're doing is different. We're doing the beat reporting of local government. We're actually going to the meetings, and the newspapers are relying on us to do their daily work that normally they would have done. Uh, a reporter called me this week. He's like, Brian, um, I see there's a Water Authority board meeting Thursday at 8.15. You know, I'd rather go to the school board meeting that night. Uh, can you guys cover the 8.15 meeting? And I said, sure, Sean, I'll do that. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's really different, I think, is doing that sort of uh, beat reporting. Now, what are the obstacles around the country? The obstacles I've seen is that in a lot of communities, the bloggers and the newspapers don't like each other. Why is that? A lot of those bloggers were fired from the newspaper. They were downsized. Well, they're embedded in their community. They don't want to move. They just want to tell stories. So they start blogging in their local community. They look at their newspaper that they used to work for, and they say, oh, that's a relic. You know, these guys don't understand innovation. I'm going to show them. I'm going to blog. I'm going to put audio up. I'm going to put movies up. And I'm going to cover it like, you know, nobody ever did before. The newspaper looks at the bloggers, and they're skeptical, even if they used to work for them. They're skeptical that that is a legitimate form of journalism. And so what's unusual in Charlottesville is that the managing editor of the newspaper said, I want to try something different. I've watched these guys. It's legitimate content. If you don't believe them, the audio is right there. You can listen to the meeting for yourself. 
And so he took that leap of faith. And, you know, that's hard to do in a company like Media General uh, to be an innovator like that. But I, I give them full credit for coming to us and saying, let's, let's see if we can work something out that'll be good for this community. We have time for one more question. Brian, this is sort of a follow-up uh, on what you just said about ProPublica. Could you mention that you all are doing focus groups and that you're planning to do a, a, a survey? Uh, how does that fit into your concept of community journalism uh, when most of what you've talked about is attending meetings and you know, really community-based? I guess I'm not real clear there because certainly uh, the, the, the focus groups and the survey are research-based and the kinds of things that right. ProPublica and uh, Polifax and so forth do. Yep. So uh, the focus groups we did in 2007 were the most interesting uh, public policy adventure I've ever had in our community. Um, we were in a neighboring hotel room watching our community members, you know, via video, they knew we were watching them, talk about our community. And I wish every elected official in town could have sat there and watched this. It was fascinating. What we got out of it was understanding where the community was on a set of issues about rural area protection. We went in there and we said, you know, we, we asked the facilitators, and the facilitators have done these all over the country. They said they've never seen anything like a Charlottesville focus group. Words like infrastructure, designated growth areas, you know, just rolled off people's tongues like it was <laughs> a common thing to talk about every day. We thought we were going to have to explain to them that there was a designated growth area. We asked them to put a, you know, a note on the map where they lived. They all understood that. They understood Albemarle County's plan was to have designated growth areas and rural areas where growth didn't happen. But what we didn't expect was for them to say how upset they were about concurrency of infrastructure, that growth was getting out ahead of schools, of roads, of pipes, and they're upset about it. So how does that help us do our job? What well, helps us tell a more complete story, so then we go into these meetings and our radar is sort of up on uh, that frame. You know, some might think of that as, as a bias, but you know, I think of it as a, we're trying to carefully frame these issues, which are very complex, and, and tell, them, tell that story in a way that's engaging to people. And when we talk, you know, when we hear people talk about, I'm upset, you know, the, why, why aren't you building the sidewalk ahead of time? You know, we'll highlight that issue because we know the community cares about it. On polling and surveys, well, you know, I, national newspapers do it all the time, right? They used to do a lot more of it. What, let's do the horse race poll. How, how is this, you know, how are the candidates looking heading into this race? In a lot of ways, what we're doing is no different. We want to share the results of these uh, surveys uh, to find out what the community is really thinking about major road projects and, and how government is doing. That's one of the questions we're going to ask is, you know, how effective is your local government at listening to your concerns? Questions along those lines. And that gives us, again, something else we can write stories about and uh, I think help move the community towards a deeper level of engagement and get those elected officials thinking more carefully about how they do uh, their work as well. Great question. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise and your stories about your experiences of Charlottesville tomorrow and community-based journalism in the Charlottesville Albemarle area. And also I'd like to say thank you to the audience members that shared your uh, questions and comments.